What's happening? Wow. You guys have a good Thanksgiving? Yeah? Did you guys eat enough turkey? No. No, you didn't let the turkey juice, like, get into your dessert, did you? You guys made sure it was set apart, right? Okay, good, because I made sure to make sure my dessert was totally set apart. So um, one of the things I love about the Christmas season are all the cheesy movies that come out. We all have our like, favorite movies that roll out. Um, and I'm going to give you guys, I'm going to be honest, my favorite, without a doubt, is The Grinch, the live action. Not the cartoon. I mean, the cartoon is pretty sweet. Um, the first cartoon, obviously the original, and the second cartoon, I think The Grinch might be too nice throughout. doesn't really paint a picture of The Grinch. But I like the live action Grinch. It's my favorite. The one-liners that come from that movie, I probably have way too many of them in my own life because of that. Um, but I love The Grinch. Uh, probably in my top three over all movies of all time. And I think maybe some of you would disagree with that. How many would disagree with that? Wow, a lot of you. Okay, how many of you like The Grinch? Okay, sweet. So you guys are going to come to the Christmas party dressed up as The Grinch, right? Okay, good. Good. Okay, so one of the things I love about movies is the fact that, like, it's one big story, right? Like, you got some guy that wrote out this whole plot line, like the Grinch, for, for instance. Like, somebody wrote this whole thing out on paper. Dr. Seuss is probably who wrote that. Um, and he writes out how the story is going to go. And then what happens is somebody comes in and directs that movie, and then the movie is made. You have, like, the buildup of what's going on. Then you have, like, the story. There's, like, this problem that is, uh, that's presented. And then, then all of a sudden we have this crescendo and this climax at the end, right? So... A story, a movie's awesome. I love to go see them. I'm sure you guys can agree. But what happens if you roll in on a movie like partway through? I do this to Allie all the time. She'll be watching a show or she'll be watching a movie and I'll walk in and be like, what's going on right now? And she's like, come on. Like, <laughs> how can I understand what's happening with the whole story if I just come in and get bits and pieces of it all at just in, in fragments? I don't understand the whole story. I'm just getting bits and pieces. And I think sometimes maybe the Bible is like that to us. We read some of these stories, and we're like, what's going on? Like, I don't understand what's happening. Like, I feel maybe confused by what's going on. Maybe some of you, like, the Lord is stirring in your heart, and I've heard a lot of you say, like, where do I start? What's the first book? A lot of people will say, why don't you start in the book of John, right? Here's the crazy thing about the Bible. It doesn't matter what book you're in. It all is going to point to Christ, it doesn't matter if you step in partway through and you read a story that talks about any book in the Bible, 66 books, especially through the Old Testament, any book you open, you're going to read a story and you're going to find one central character underneath all of it, and that is Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. The Bible is one collective story about one person, the Savior of the world, and that's Jesus Christ. There is no movie that's like that out there. You can't pop into any story, any book, any movie, and figure out what the whole story is based off of what's in there, except for the Bible. It all points to one person. It's supernatural. It's absolutely unbelievable. It's all about one person. And so we have been in this whole series called Kings of Kingdoms, like going through the Old Testament. And I want to take a scarlet thread what I mean by a scarlet thread, I want to take like a piece of yarn, let's call it, that's like dipped in Jesus' blood because the entire Bible, he has woven himself through every page, every page of history. It's all about him and it comes right to the cross. And so I want to try to connect some dots for you guys because when Jesus was, after Jesus rose from, rose from the dead, like it shook everything, like Here's this guy, everybody thought he was the savior. He ends up getting nailed to a cross, gets put into a tomb, and then he rises from the dead three days later. It's like a disarray everywhere. And he's got these two disciples that are completely distraught after this has happened. And what Jesus does is he, like, he comes, he appears to these guys while they're just walking down the road. And like, he disguises himself. They don't recognize who he is. He's just a a bystander walking and traveling, and he, and he just starts traveling and walking with these guys. And these guys are having a conversation. Basically, they're crushed because the, the Savior had just, the Savior that they thought had come had just, he's gone, and they're defeated, 
right? And so he asked them, what's going on? And they're like, how come you don't know about what's going on here? Like, everybody in Israel knows what's happening right now. Like, this guy Jesus, he just died on the cross, and like, it's a, everything's a mess. Like, and so Jesus then tells them, he says to them, he says, what are these, uh, he says, okay, in verse 25 of Luke 24, he goes on and tells the guys, oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Prophets being all the people in the Old Testament, all these people that God came upon to talk about Jesus, who when he came and he arrived. It says, was it not necessary for the Christ to suffer these things and to enter into his glory? And then in verse 27, he says, then beginning with Moses and with all the prophets, he explained to them the things concerning himself and all the scriptures. So what Jesus did was he came alongside these guys and gave them like a personal Bible study and went through the whole Old Testament and showed them everything in the Old Testament was about him and it pointed to him. Like I would have loved to have been at that Bible study, uh, what he said to them. But everything in this Bible, it points to him. It's all about him. The plan, he had a plan. Just like a director for a movie or a writer for a movie had a plan to write something out. God had a plan right from the beginning. And his plan was always to rescue you guys. It was always to send a savior. It starts in the beginning. When God created this place, he created earth, he created everything in it. We've talked about this. He created you guys. The breath that we're talking about putting in our lungs, he put that breath in your lungs. And he placed man in the garden and everything was great. It was awesome. They had fellowship with God. They walked with God. It was amazing. But then we know that man fell. God gave him a choice and man chose to go his own way. And then sin enters the world. And so rebellion against God. And this creates a fracture in our relationship with God. We can't have fellowship with God because our sin breaks that. And so what God ends up doing is he sends out a series of curses upon mankind, upon woman specifically, because she ate of the fruit, because Adam, he ate of the fruit as well. And then he puts it on the creation, the earth itself, and then he puts it on Satan. And so I want to read what that says, because in this, this is the first indicator that we have of a prophecy of God was planning to send a savior. Three pages into the Bible, in Genesis 3.15, he says, this is him talking to Satan. He says, I will put enmity. Enmity means open hostility, um, basically conflict between you, you being, him being Satan, your, between you and the woman, and between your seed, which would be Satan can't like make people but he can control people and they can belong to him. If you don't choose God, you've chosen to follow Satan and so you would belong to him and not to God. And then any of the angels that would have fell with him, all of his people, the powers of the air, like his army that like wreaks havoc all over this place, okay? Um, Those that are in rebellion to God, he says, and her seed. And what this means is this would be the the coming Messiah. Okay, so one day, God was going to send a savior in to the world to rescue mankind. And so he's going to create this conflict. So now that Satan knows that there's this conflict that's going to happen, he's going to attack, okay? Um, And then the verse goes on and it says, he shall fatally bruise your head. He being this Messiah, the savior, meaning that he will defeat the serpent. He will destroy him. So Satan now knows that one day he's going to be defeated. And it says, but you shall only bruise his heel. You'll only make a mark upon him. And that's exactly what happened on the cross. Jesus was only basically wounded, but he rose from the dead and he defeated death. He defeated sin. So what we have here is the first prophecy in the Bible, three pages in, that God had a plan to rescue all of you. And so what he ended up doing was, we had to know that there's a Messiah that's gonna be born, 
you had Adam and Eve. Well, then they start make, it's repopulating the earth. Well, we don't know who this is going to come from. So what ends up happening is God starts to like, refine this plan. He gives more details, and we see that in the scriptures. We see it with Noah. Like, there's rebellion over the whole earth as it like, populates out, and Noah is the only family that's found to be righteous. So God destroys the world, and he brings Noah through the flood. Okay, So we see that happen with Noah. Then we get to the people of Abraham. We've learned about him. He's the guy that God promised he was going to make a great nation out of him. Like he was going to make him a people. These were going to be God's people, right? So he made him this promise that he was going to send the seed, the Messiah, through his family, through these people that he was going to make from them. So then we keep reading on and he refines it even more. Abraham's son Isaac, not Ishmael, but Isaac. Isaac is going to be the one where it's going to come through. And God reestablishes his promise, saying it's going to be there. So he's taking this thread, and he's weaving it through the pages, right? And he's tracking how this Messiah is going to come about, how Jesus is going to get here. Then we get to Jacob. This is Isaac's son. Jacob ends up having 12 sons, and they become the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is like this this people. They're becoming into a monster nation, right? They're They're going to turn into like millions of people, okay? And so he picks, he picks Jacob, and Jacob has these 12 sons. And what ends up happening with Jacob is at the end of his life, he gives out these, these blessings and these prophecies to each one of his sons, telling them what's going to be of their future, what's going to happen with each one of them. So with each tribe, he goes through each one of them, okay? And then he comes to the tribe of Judah, and he says this. He says, the scepter of royalty, a scepter is... I think I got a picture of one. A scepter is what a king would hold. Like you see like, like a king holding one of these things and it would represent his authority over, like ultimate authority over a nation. It's just something they would have, okay? He's saying that a scepter, you guys with me here? I know I'm like getting down the rabbit hole here. Okay, so the scepter, which would be the kingship of the people of Israel at this time, okay? Um, it says, shall not depart from Judah nor the ruler's staff from between his feet until Shiloh, the Messiah, he comes. So basically what he's telling Judah is one day there's going to be a kingship that's going to rise out of your family that's going to come from your tribe, a scepter. Well, at this point, Israel doesn't have a king. Like they're just a small group of people, but eventually they grow into a huge group of people. And what we learned from earlier in the season, if you were with us, Israel asked for a king, and God granted them a king, okay? And he's saying that when this scepter enters in, which was King David, he became the king, he was from the line of Judah, that it was going to stay in his family line all the way, and this is when the Messiah would come. And that's exactly what ended up happening. King David became king, and then God even uh, recommunicated his promise and said, I'm going to bring about the Messiah through your line, and that's what happened. So that brings us into the New Testament, into Matthew and Luke. You guys ever read through the genealogies? You guys know what that is? The genealogies, like it's this guy begat that guy, this guy begat that guy. It's like the like really boring. You're like, I need to skip over this. Anybody ever done that? Okay. Well, I mean, I've done it early on in my faith. Like when I was like fired up for the Lord, I'm like, I get to that part and I put it on audio and it's like, this person begat this person, this person begat this person. And I'm like, oh, what the heck is all this? I'm like, I don't need to know about any of this. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. And so like he lays it out in Matthew chapter one, we have one, like we have one list that shows the genealogy. I think you got a, I got a picture up there. Okay. So you got one in the book of Luke that follows the, um, the line of Mary, from David all the way to Mary, okay? Because we know the Messiah is going to come through this line. And then on the other side, Joseph, Mary's husband, okay, he also comes from David, but from a totally different branch. So both are from the line of Judah, And so what we have here is we have this crazy genealogy that tracks us all the way from Jesus, the Savior of the world, all the way to Adam, the first man God ever breathed life into. So what we have is God taking a scarlet thread and weaving it through, showing you exactly how he was going to bring about the Messiah. 
And he did that. That happened. 2,000 years ago, that happened. He was born. God had a plan, and he brought it to fruition. And the enemy, let me tell you, he tried to stop that. Remember, he said he would put enmity. So Satan began an attack on mankind. He didn't know at first who, how this was going to happen, right? He began an attack on mankind because he didn't want the Savior to be born, okay? So Cain and Abel, after, after Adam, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel, he goes against Cain, and he rises against his brother Abel to kill him. And then Cain ends up dying. So then you have Seth that comes out, right? Fast forward, he goes and corrupts the whole world. And so God has to destroy the whole world except for Noah's family. He tried doing it there, but he was unsuccessful. The Israelite people, constantly after the Israelite people. Think about Egypt. Pharaoh. Remember the story about him throwing all the babies in the Nile? Satan constantly under attack, trying to gather us. Because as God refined his plan down, Satan went after it. We get to Saul. He tried to kill David how many times? Ten years while he was on the run. Haman, later on in the, New, and later on in the Old Testament, a guy named Haman tries to commit genocide, like a total destruction on all of the Israelite people. The New Testament, King Herod tried to destroy Jesus by sending, because he knew the Messiah was going to be born in a little town called Bethlehem. And so he had every baby killed in that town to try to wipe it out. But he couldn't stop it because Jesus is king. He had a plan to rescue you. It was his plan right from the beginning. 2,000 years ago in that little town of Bethlehem, he was born, the savior of the world, Jesus Christ. God came here and he was born of a human being from Mary, from that genealogy I showed. And that man lived a sinless life. And he went all the way to the cross. He took that scarlet thread all the way to the cross. And he nailed your sin upon himself on that cross. And the punishment that you and I deserve, he took in our place. God had a plan that was his plan right from the beginning. We can trust God's plan. I wonder if you guys trust his plan. Every book you read through, like Jesus is in it. I once had a pastor when I was growing up, and I remember him saying this, and I never understood it. He said that you could open up any book of the Bible, and it should bleed. Like the scarlet thread should be there. The fact that Jesus Christ sacrificed his life for you. He said you should be able to open up any book of the Bible and lead somebody to Christ. Because the whole book is about him. It's all about what he did for you. And that's why we celebrate this Christmas season is because the Savior was born 2,000 years ago. You know, it's interesting. I read, I was curious because sometimes I like to like go deep down the rabbit hole because the Bible's deep. It's like, it's alive and active. I mean, it's supernatural. it's, It's unbelievable. Every time you read through it, it's like you see something different, right? And so you, like, you wonder, like, so I look up, like, what does, what, does scar- what does this color come from? Scarlet thread, right? The Bible talks about crimson and, and things like that. And it's interesting. When I looked up what it meant or how they got that color, it was this little worm, like, that only was in the, the nation of Israel, okay? And what they would do is this worm would be crushed, okay? And they would extract this dye out of this worm. And that was the dye that was used for like the threads that were in the veil of the temple, the priestly garments. That's how they would get this color thread, right? Well, in the Bible, Jesus calls himself a worm. This worm is called the crimson worm. And when you translate this word over, he says in Psalm 22 that he is like a worm. This is a prophecy in the book of Psalms that talks about how he would be despised and it talks about his crucifixion in detail. It's crazy. Written a thousand years before he was actually, it actually happened. And he compares himself to this worm that extracts this dye to make this. So I want to read this for you guys. Okay, and it's, it might blow your mind. This is it blew my mind. Okay, so this comes from 
the discoverycreation.org. This is what they wrote about it. The crimson worm, the Caucus ilicus, is a very special worm that looks like a grub, looks more like a grub than a worm. When it is time for a female or mother crimson worm to have babies, which she does only once in her life, she finds a trunk of a tree, a wooden fence post, or a stick, and she attaches, she attaches her body to that wood and makes a hard crimson shell. She is so strongly and permanently stuck to the wood that that shell can never be removed without tearing the body completely apart and killing her. The crimson worm then lays, the crimson worm then lays her eggs under her body and the protective shell. And then when the baby worms or the larvae hatch, they stay under the shell. Not only does the mother body, the mother's body give protection to her babies, but it also provides them with food. The babies feed on the living body of the mother. After a few days, when the young worms grow to the point that they are able to take care of themselves, the mother dies. As the mother crimson worm dies, she oozes out a crimson or scarlet red dye, which only stains the wood she is attached to, but it also her young children. They are colored scarlet red for the rest of their lives. After three days, the dead mother crimson worm's body loses its crimson color and it turns into a white wax, which falls to the ground like snow. So what did Jesus mean by saying, I am a worm? There are a lot of ideas what Jesus might have meant, but nobody really knows for sure. However, it is very interesting that just like the crimson worm, Jesus sacrificed or gave up his life on a tree so that his children might be washed with the crimson blood and their sins cleaned white as snow. He died for us that we might live through him. So, I mean, we're talking about God creating a worm that would demonstrate the gospel. Okay? God had a plan, and his plan was always to send Christ. And he sent Christ for you so you could have a right standing relationship with God. So, my question to you guys is do you trust that plan? You guys are going to go into your groups right now, and I want you guys to get real as always, okay?